So Lincoln County Reads is a program presented by the libraries of Lincoln County, Oregon, and supported by our local friends groups and foundations. The Driftwood Public Library, the Driftwood Public Library Foundation, the Newport Public Library, Newport Public Library Foundation, Siletz Public Library, Siletz Valley Friends of the Library, Toledo Public Library, Waldport Public Library, Waldport Friends of the Library, Oregon Coast Community College Library, Gwynn Library at the Hatfield Marine Science Center, and the Lincoln County Library District. Welcome to our wrap up program with our special guest, Silvia Moreno Garcia, author of our Lincoln County Reads 2022 book, Mexican Gothic. Sylvia is Mexican by birth, Canadian by inclination, and she's the author of a number of acclaimed novels in, in addition to our Lincoln County Reads 2022 book, Mexican Gothic. And I just need to say that I recommend um, all of them. She's wonderful. Um, I would, they, they include her newest, which is the daughter of Dr. Moreau, um, Gods of Jade and Shadow and Velvet Was the Night. She also has a number of short stories um, that are available in your local Lincoln County libraries. Sylvia has won the Locust and Locus and British Fantasy Awards for her work as a novelist and the World Fantasy Award as an editor. She has an MA in Science and Technology Studies from the University of British Columbia, and she is our neighbor to the north in Vancouver, British Columbia. So I'm going to turn the screen over to Sylvia. She will be giving us a presentation and then she and our colleague Kirsten Brodbeck Kenny from the um, Driftwood Public Library will um, we'll have some questions. So, and, uh, and I'm gonna be speaking for 15 minutes. I'm gonna start sharing my screen in just a few seconds. I'll speak for 15 minutes about Gothic literature and what it means. Then, uh, as was mentioned, I'll be uh, speaking with Kirsten. She'll be uh, uh, talking with me and you can input your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So if this works, I should be able to share my screen and you should be able to be seeing at this point in time, a couple of pumpkins and a graveyard on your screen. Um, shout and wave if you can see them. Yes, we can see them. <laughs> Everything's going well. Perfect, okay. So uh, because you folks were reading Mexican Gothic, I thought I would talk a little bit about what Gothic means. And a gothic novel is romantic fiction with an atmosphere of mystery and or horror. Uh, romantic, however, doesn't mean what we normally think about when we consider romance nowadays, which is uh, those books with Fabio on the cover or rom-coms on the Netflix. Uh, romantic means it comes from the romantic movement, which was in vogue in the 1800s. And the emphasis in that time was on feeling. It was seen as a response to uh, a response of imagination over reason. So it's not reason, here it's emotion. And for that reason, everything is huge and nothing is muted. So there's a lot of drama and sensationalism. It's why you find Heathcliff not talking rationally about the death of Kathy in Wuthering Heights. You find him trying to dig up her grave desperately in the middle of the night. Uh, Gothic fiction gets its beginning in 1764 with a novel called The Castle of Otranto, continues into the 1800s, then it kind of dips out of sight and it has a revival in the 20th century around the 1960s. And we'll talk really quickly about all of this. But first of all, how do we define Gothic fiction? Uh, the traditional category is female versus male Gothic, but I'll skip to, through that. Um, and talk about Gothic horror versus Gothic romance. Gothic horror is a battle between humanity and the natural forces of evil, sometimes man-made, sometimes supernatural, within an oppressive and escapable and bleak landscape. This is a true trademark of a Gothic horror novel. On the other hand, you have the Gothic romance where the female protagonist battles through terrifying ordeals while struggling to be with her true love. And an example of these would be something like The Monk. That's a traditional Gothic horror story. The devil even appears at one point in The Monk and violent things happening and supernatural things happen during the whole thing. 
And then we have Wuthering Heights with Emily Bronte, where the romance and the sort of love triangle that is established in this story uh, with Heathcliff and Catherine, it takes center stage. So very different kind of like same sort of space, but the Gothic is like a spectrum and you can imagine Gothic horror on one side and then you have uh, Gothic romance on the other. And that's why people sometimes get confused because they'll be like, oh no, something horrific happened in this book. And that's not what I think of when I think about Gothic. They were probably thinking about Gothic romance and the other way around. If somebody is like, oh, it's just a lot of kissing and embracing in this book. That was probably because they were expecting Gothic horror and instead they got Gothic romance. So it's just this big spectrum. There are certain tropes that reappear over and over again in Gothic fiction. And one of them is the importance of women, of the female character. Now, traditionally, the heroine of a Gothic novel used to be a pious virginal orphan prone to fainting. And here we have a fainting scale, which so shows us that uh, Matilda actually swoons eight times in the recess, uh, compared to Mina, who only swoons one time. <laughs> what these women have in, in common, aside from a certain amount of swooning, is that uh, they are women in distress, a women without a protector. For example, Jane Eyre is an orphan. They are lonesome or isolated, perhaps in a distant castle or a, or a state. They are vulnerable. And that's the appeal. The odds are not in her favor. Another element uh, that is quite common in Gothic fiction is the figure of the other. So anyone who isn't a white middle class Protestant is frightening. There are scary Catholics and scary poor people and all kinds of scary foreigners, including Dracula, who are threatening uh, the good white middle-class Protestant people. These evil others in the beginning, when Gothic fiction is taking form, come a lot of times from Italy or Spain. But as Britain's empire expands, there is a vast resource of frightening others uh, who replace the Italian anti-heroes of Walpole or Radcliffe. And you start getting evil and mysterious Indians or perhaps people from the Caribbean who might not be up to lots of good stuff and might be hiding some terrible madness or some terrible deeds. So the evil others are another theme of Gothic fiction. Gothic men are another um, distinctive characteristic of Gothic fiction. You have often a Byronic hero, a man who is bad, mad, and dangerous to know. There's a simultaneous attraction, repulsion, love, fear going on. Most of the pure Gothics tend to have a handsome magnetic suitor or husband who may or may not be a lunatic and or a murderer says Terry Carr, the ace editor who revived Gothics in the 1960s. And Molly Haskell tells us, cruelty and coldness are indispensable elements in the fascination these men hold for these particular women. Bergman remains under Boyer's spell. She's talking about the movie Gaslight. Indeed, most completely surrenders to its sexual implications after she has discovered his true nature. So what is going on? What is up with these evil yet attractive men? Well, one of the reasons for the appeal might be fairy tales, the, that Gothic novels kind of retain some elements of traditional fairy tales, such as Beauty and the Beast and Bluebeard. Fairy tales often have elements of darkness in them. For example, Cinderella's sisters cut off part of their feet to stuff them into the shoe. A sleeping beauty must sleep for a very long time until she's woken up. But at the end of the tale, we always have a happy ending where love triumphs of our darkness. But another reason why we have these dark yet desirable men might, mean, be, might be because Gothics provide an opportunity to explore romance and sexuality, transgressive thoughts, desires, and impulses in a time period in which they, it was not allowed for those thoughts, desires, and impulses to be uh, put out in the open. Uh, so as a result, all of this is somewhat repressed and not explicit. 
Another characteristic of the Gothic novel is that the chills come slowly. It's about tension. There may not be a literal ghost, but you should feel haunted. And there are often supernatural threats, or at least the idea that there could be a supernatural threat. Curses, visions, portents, ghosts, demons, vampires, witches. There is uncertainty and doubt. Even if it's not truly supernatural, often in the gothics of the 1960s, uh, we get a Scooby-Doo situation where it turns out that it was the old farmer uh, disguised as a ghost and these kids, you know, or in this case, this young woman discovered the truth and revealed that. Uh, but still, there should be the fear that, oh, maybe there was a ghost or maybe there was a demon. So there's um, an unexplained threat, a threat maybe from beyond. Gothic fiction was that it was quite popular in the 19th century. And then, as I said, it dipped in popularity. Eventually, it gave way to what we call the new Gothic romances of the 1960s and the 70s. And these look like this. You probably recognize them if you've been in a used uh, paperback store, or maybe you've seen them online. These are all these women running away from danger, generally running away from a house. And they become huge in the 60s. And, uh, and we have to thank an ace editor for that, for bringing them back. Uh, the format of these books is very important to their success. These are paperbacks. They're small format, cheap books, and they're designed for very fast consumption. Women are supposed to be finding them at the supermarket or the drugstore, and you're supposed to be picking it up as if it were a bag of chips or candy. You're going to have one or two every week. And women do. They just, they get into it, and they're consuming all this gothic fiction. And it's and it's enormous. You get reprints of some old books from the 1800s. You get new books. They all have this kind of aesthetic. They all have this sort of governess who's going to a distant estate and finding a mystery that she needs to solve. And these are the new Gothic romances of the mid 20th century. But then Gothics end and they start disappearing from bookshelves and you don't see them again uh, once you get into the 1980s. And there's a few here and there, but it's very, very few compared to what used to be. And why did this happen? Well, two different types of novels appear in the late 70s and they usher a new era of fiction. And one of them is a modern romance novel, such as The Flame and the Flower. And these have uh, explicit sex, explicit romance. So suddenly the Gothic novel starts to look fuddy-duddy. And women don't really want that. They want the Fabio on the cover. They want the clinch. They want the woman being seduced on the, on the page, not just sublimated desire. And so they start going for that. And then you get horror novels really uh, picking up steam with Stephen King. And you've got Carrie and you've got uh, The Exorcist and all these other books. And that kind of explicit horror, much uh, not just a Scooby-Doo kind of thing of like maybe the farmer is a ghost, maybe not that takes hold and people now want that. So they want horror, uh, Alice Stephen King, or they want sexy books like uh, Wood with uh, Flame and the Flower. And that decimates the, the Gothic novel revival of the 1960s. It basically, the new Gothics disappear. But does it really end? Because we can see the Gothic kind of having children. It, 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 it leaves progeny behind. I think that domestic noir seems to harness many of the fears and elements of Gothic novels into a new format. When you think about books like The Girl on the Train or The Woman in the Window, they have some of the same elements of old Gothic novels. They have a woman at the center, they have her isolated, they have her trying to solve a mystery and the domestic is her realm. So maybe Gothics don't really uh, go away completely, they mutate and reappear. Uh, late in the, um, a few years ago. And then we have, well, you know, you can never, just like you can never keep a vampire in the grave, you can't keep horror in the grave. And horror seems to be a commercially viable genre for major imprints in the 1990s. Like I said, 1980s is a heyday of horror. You've got not only Stephen King, but tons of other writers producing a bunch of books. But in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, that cottage industry collapses. Suddenly, authors have to start writing other stuff because nobody's really buying horror. All the imprints close down. But a few years ago, we started to see the success of 
horror books again in the mainstream. They have been maintained, obviously, by small press prints in, in, the, in the small press world. But now we start seeing um, people like Grady Hendrix putting out My Best Friend's Exorcist, Stephen Graham Jones putting out several books and moving from the small presses to the big presses. I put out Mexican Gothic. And um, I got an email from Goodreads just the other day that listed um, recent uh, Gothic fiction in the last few years. And I was quite surprised uh, just last year in 2021 and in 2022, we got double or triple of what we would have had in previous years. So it's definitely uh, fermenting and we're getting more Gothic. We might be at the verge of a new Gothic revival, just like we had it in the 1960s. It might be back again. We're seeing, we're starting to see some, some stuff like young adult Gothic, things like that. So it might be coming back. Yes, again, just like vampires, Gothic fiction cannot be kept in the coffin and returns. And so that brings us to uh, Mexican Gothic. This is an illustration from Mexican Gothic showing several of the characters from that book, including Noemi there in the center. Uh, that brings us to uh, to the end of my presentation. I hope you learned some stuff about good gothic fiction, and maybe you have some good questions that you can put it in the Q and A. And now I'm going to switch the host over back to Mary Kay. And uh, and there we go. So this is Kirsten Brodbeck Kenny. She is the director of the of the Drift, Driftwood Public Library in Lincoln City. Um, for those of you who were with us for the earlier Spanish language session, um, you may notice that we get all of our talent from the Driftwood Public Library. So we appreciate their, um, their stepping up today. And Kirsten, go right ahead and ask your questions. Okay. Well, I, I hope this is not too boring because I know that you already answered most of these questions in Spanish, but uh, I'm looking forward to, to having a conversation. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me, your, your biography says that you were, are Mexican by birth and Canadian by inclination, which I kind of love. Um, can you tell us more about your ex experiences growing up and how you became Canadian? Yes, I was uh, born and spent my early childhood in Baja California near the American border. And eventually my parents moved around the country and we lived in several cities. We established ourselves in Mexico City around the time I was probably 11. And I lived there until I was a grown woman who then decided to go to Canada, where I eventually obtained a master's degree in science and technology studies. So my first language is Spanish. My I, I grew up in Mexico and Canada. Canada is my adopted home now. Great. Thank you. So since Spanish is your first language, um, you've mentioned in interviews that choosing to write in English was kind of a matter of practicality, uh, given the lack of Spanish language outlets for speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, horror. Do you think you would still make that choice if you were starting your career today? Um, how have things changed or not changed for Spanish speaking writers of speculative fiction? They really haven't changed since 2006, which is when I started publishing short fiction. There are very few Spanish language imprints dedicated to publishing science fiction, fantasy, or horror, especially when we're talking about Latin America. There are maybe a couple more when we are including Spain. It's really, uh, there's not like that many magazines and not met that many opportunities. Most of what there is in Latin America is literary fiction, mm -hmm. whether in the form of magazines or in the form of imprints. And that's just because there are also, well, there's not that much uh, money in books in Latin America in general. Uh, there might be a lot less bookstores and maybe not even any libraries in certain countries and definitely in Mexico. It's not a bookstore heavy, library heavy place and libraries do not operate at all the way that American libraries operate. So there are just um, less opportunities for everything, but specifically for fantasy, science fiction and horror, there are almost none in that market. That's not something that just applies to me. There's people in other countries. I know people from um, Malaysia, people from India, people from other parts of the world where the situation is basically the same, that we don't really have any kind of thriving uh, publishing 
industry in our nations and especially in certain categories like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, there's really nothing there because the government, if it's providing any kind of support or literary awards or anything like that, they're going towards other kinds of writing and these are not considered um, desirable modes of writing. Gotcha. Yeah, I've noticed uh, the same thing, you know, in purchasing items for our Spanish language collection that uh, most of what you can find in science fiction and fantasy is in translation. Yeah. Um, what stereotypes or assumptions about your writing have you encountered? Um, do people expect you to be Gabriel Garcia Marquez writing magic, magical realism, um, even though that's not the type of thing that you write? Yes, I think that every writer who is Latin American or of Latin American descent is expected to write magic realism, which is like expecting uh, a young writer nowadays to be writing in the mode of uh, Hemingway. Uh, that's really kind of outdated and a uh, few people are probably doing it like that nowadays. And it just has to do with uh, stereotypes and kind of the space that is allocated to certain kinds of writing. When you think about a writer who is non-Latino, um, you know, I would say, you know, your average white writer, there is no item or story type that is close to them. You can write romantic comedies, you could, you know, want to write thrillers, uh, uh, very serious dramas, all that kind of stuff. But when it comes uh, to Latin American writers, it often seems that the two modes of writing that are okay for us, maybe painful immigration stories, or a little bit of magic realism. And if you say, well, I want to write about uh, robots fighting in space or um, uh, romance uh, story, then people kind of look at you funny. Agents and editors don't want to acquire it. And there's a lot of doubts about you being able to make it in the market. Um, and unfortunately, that is something that I faced and that I see constantly still happening. We really do have to get a lot more writers of all types writing all kinds of different fiction. Agreed. Speaking of all kinds of different fiction, um, you've written in a wide range of genres within sort of that science fiction, fantasy, horror bucket. Um, do you make a conscious choice when you're looking at a project to pick a genre like oh, I've always wanted to write a gothic novel or a noir novel or is it something that kind of happens during the process it depends on the book so for example for something like gods of jade and shadow I wanted to write a quest story a traditional quest story um, in the mode of the hero's journey and I wanted to see if I could do it um, but a signal to noise which was my debut is a bit of a mixture of everything it's both a coming of age story and absolutely not. It's uh, both, it has some elements of the fantastic, but it's very slight. And so it's, it's hard to categorize it and to say what it is. And when I finished it, I did not know what it would be called. And my publisher didn't know what it would be called either. And they had a really hard time placing it. And, uh, and it's, it's come out now in a re-edition and it has a different cover and it's had three different covers during its lifetime. And I think that was part of because the publisher didn't know how to position it in the market. The second cover said for fans of Stranger Things, although it's nothing like Stranger <laughs> Things, but it was said part of it, at least one of the timelines in the 80s. So I think they just were like, well, put a Stranger Things font and, and let's see if that works. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's definitely sometimes something that has happened to me where I'm just like, well, here's this thing. And then the question becomes, what shelf is this thing going to live on? Right. So one of the things that I really enjoyed about um, Mexican Gothic is that there's kind of this, there's a whole history about white men who stumble upon mystic power in the jungle or in foreign places. Um, you know, when I was reading Mexican Gothic, the flashback scenes um, with Howard Doyle in the cave reminded me at first of scenes about like mystical savages in an Indiana Jones movie or in Lovecraft or one of those um, books like that. But then you you kind of turn that trope on its head and it's Doyle who's already corrupt rather than being corrupted by like ancient magic, which is usually what you see in these other stories. Um, did you worry that readers wouldn't see that distinction, that they would mistake this for an, yet another, you know, 
um, mystical savages sort of story? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, when I was talking about Gothic fiction, one of the elements that often reoccurs in Gothic fiction is the figure of the other. So this is the intruder. You have the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant man, uh, wealthy, of course, set up as a pinnacle of civilization. And, and the danger is the encroachment of this figure of the other, which is mm, often racialized. So mm -hmm. the fear comes from that person coming in from kind of like a brown space into the white space and perhaps decimating, attacking, or destroying uh, this civilized man. And it's very much that kind of fear. In Mexican Gothic, uh, the relationship is reversed because we have Noemi Tabuada, who is a Mexican woman, and she is entering into this dangerous space, which is controlled by um, these white men. And so then it's not the other being um, the Mexican, the dangerous element, she is the protagonist, but these people um, who she's encountering who might be intent on violence are the kind of people who might traditionally have been featured as the heroes in this sort of story, in this sort of journey. And that inversion of roles is one of the tricks that the novel plays. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to switch to a question from the uh, Q&A. Um, Elizabeth McGill writes, hello, I found Noemi's character to be extremely refreshing. It seems as today's heroines are all very similar, quiet, smart, introverted, like Katniss Everdeen. Noemi is very social and perceptive and it gives us a new way to experience the story. What was your inspiration for her character? So again, hearkening back to Gothic books and the Gothic mode, the traditional Gothic heroine was for a very long time, this kind of meek, quiet girl who fainted quite a bit as we saw in that fainting scale, maybe even 10 times in a book. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when we got to the Gothic revival in the 1960s, this still continued in certain ways. I mean, by that point, the heroine had metamorphosed in a kind of amateur detective, but she was still in a position of submission to the man in the house. She was normally maybe a governess or, 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 or a young wife who had no power in the relationship. And so she was in a social in a position in which she was still the guy was here and the woman was a little bit below. Um, and I wanted to change that with Noemi, partially because of that inversion that I talked about, the figure of the other. I wanted her to come in on an even foot with the people in the house so that she would not be a maid, uh, for example, that's going to be scrubbing floors, that she would be this young woman who is a social equal to these people. And more than that, it would be this young woman who would perceive the distorted space that these people are um, are, are maintaining. So, you know, they are, they are kind of saying we're the lords of the manor and uh, this is our beautiful ancestral home and everything is peachy keen and she's kind of looking at ground and and being like, wow, this is all dirty and old and, and, and creepy. How can you think that you're superior when your house is in such a state and you're so such creepy people? And she can do that because of she, who she is. She's this young, modern woman who represents, in a way, the, uh, the impetus and the modernity of Mexico in this time period. Mexico is also going through this uh, kind of nation forming time period. And, and she's supposed to show us that versus the kind of decaying colonial power, uh, which is represented by the Doyles. And so I wanted her to be, yes, this very dynamic uh, sort of young woman and also very flirty. And uh, and uh, and she's very interested in, in things that might be considered vapid, such as fashion and, 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 be, and looking nice. But at the same time, she's also an intellectual. So it, uh, it it's these sort of contradictions that make her I think into an interesting character because rather than just being the ingenue of the traditional gothic novel who who faints quite a bit uh, she's sort of this dif different woman yeah and she seems very kind of keyed into the the potential danger and potential like the uh, the weird dynamics of the the high place as well she's she's not an innocent yeah, she. Um, I, th I think she knows both the benefits and some of the drawbacks of being a pretty 
uh, young women of color in this sort of space, uh, that it's also kind of a uh, maybe a, a dangerous space to to be a woman sometimes who is desirable and and young. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were reading Mexican Gothic with my, our book club here at uh, Driftwood, one of the topics folks were talking about was her desire to, to attend university. Um, how common would have been would it have been for a young woman from Mexico City to take on higher education in in the nineteen fifties? Not that common at that time period. Uh, So my grandmother wanted to uh, be a doctor, but she went into secretarial school when she was about 12 and finished when she was 15. And that the reason for that was because her family wouldn't let her study medicine because going to the faculty of medicine would mean studying with men. And uh, she would have been going to school more in the 1940s than in the 1950s, but the dynamic remained true. And for the other side of my family, from my father's side, who were wealthier and could have more, therefore, options and opportunities, uh, and the women have more choices, uh, even then, most of them did not go to school. One of my aunts did go to school, and she studied architecture, but she was the only one. All the other ones married or if they stayed single, it was because the family could support them. It was really, really important to get married. And you often didn't have a choice unless, in, like in this case, you maybe had a family that was uh, sufficiently wealthy to maintain you as a spinster. You know, that's what you were called after a certain age. And um, so it was rare. So my my aunt who actually got a degree was, was an oddity. Some people might go to school for a little bit, um, maybe get a degree. But again, even when they did that, the expectation was that it was a path towards marriage. It was a way maybe to pass time until you met an eligible young man or to meet maybe an eligible young young man if it was a co-ed environment. Um, And it was the same sort of thing for uh, for women in the United States, too. There were uh, limited options and opportunities sometimes about what you would be allowed to do. And definitely a lot of emphasis on the domestic, on on making the right kind of marriage. So Noemi is uh, really a little bit of an outlier. And part of the reason for that is because she has uh, the wealth and social position to be made be able to make some choices that maybe other women are not able to make at that time. Sure. Yeah. And of course, even she was certainly receiving a lot of pressure from her father and from the rest of her family to kind of settle down, give up on this idea of the uh, anthropology degree, things like that. Oh, she's, she's, you know, 22, 23. It it is time to settle down. (laughs) It's you're getting a little bit old. That's what people would tell you, you know, you're, you're getting old, like, like a fruit. That's what people would say to women literally in, in, in Mexico. It's it's like, it's like a banana. It it rots pretty fast. So, yeah. (laughs) No, it sounds very strange to us nowadays when people stay unmarried for a much longer periods of time. But yeah, in the 1950s, there's definitely a lot more social pressure. So when her father is having that conversation with her, um, it, it's definitely kind of like, you know, this is something that has probably been discussed several times at dinner oh, yeah. or or at breakfast. And it's just a rehash of like, settle down, find a man, you know, stop doing it. <laughs> what are you doing going to these costume parties, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could you could be married. <laughs> um let's see, there's a, another question from the chat. Um Elizabeth McGill says, I also want just want to say that I love how the female protagonists in your work, Gods of Jade and Shadow, Daughter of Dr. Moreau, Mexican Gothic, don't just end up in traditional, they lived happily ever after endings. I found I was often surprised when this did not happen, but again, so refreshing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, they they don't always uh um it doesn't always end up with the fairy tale wedding. Uh, ending it's uh, and I think especially in Mexican Gothic it's because there's this mention of fairy tales a lot in the narrative which again I'm trying to harken back to the fairy tale as maybe one of the ancestors of the Gothic um, and the parallels between that and part of it is that you know Catalina kind of thought that uh, by getting married and have you know it would it's like a fairy tale right it's like happily ever after and then it turned out to be a nightmare so um, so you don't kind of get that fairy tale wedding and 
fairy tale happiness at the end of it because perhaps it is elusive and does not really exist, or at least it did not exist for Katarina. So perhaps Noemi is a little bit more wary of that, although she probably wants to believe that things are not as bleak as they as they might seem. There are definitely some some question marks at the end, though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as you were, were, were writing this, um, did you incorporate elements of Mexican folklore in the, in the way the fungus is used to heal and extend life, or is that something that you, you invented? Uh, it's, it's an invention. There is no particular Mexican story that references fungus in that way. There are medicinal uses of fungus in Mexican culture and hallucinogenic march, mushrooms in a specific region of of Mexico that I do mention in the book. Um, and mushrooms have been used in religious rituals in a variety of cultures around the world. So that is true enough. It is also true that uh, mycelium, uh, basically the part of the mushroom that you don't see above but below ground, form networks that very much perform like a sort of cyber uh, space for mushrooms and they send information back and forth. Uh, talking and sharing resources and talking basically talking to each other in this really very big wide web so that that is also true it's it's not it's not made up it's fact um of course there's science fiction aspects to how it's handled here but it, it is based on some basic real biology and um and there is some um classic uh horror fiction and literature of the early 20th century and mid 20th century that does use fungi and mushrooms as an element of the bizarre or the um, or the scary, uh, the uncanny. And specifically, I was referencing a story when I was thinking about this book that is called A Voice in the Night, if I don't forget. And that has fungi in a very uh, central role in, in the story. So there's definitely things that I'm pulling from uh, that are real from different bits and bobs, but there's no one legend, like uh, no one specific creature of folklore that I'm talking about. There's no mushroom monster in, <laughs> in Mexican folklore that I took out and, and applied here. Sure. Um, one of the things that uh, I was curious about is, um, was there background on the people in the cave that you created that didn't make it into the story? Um, I found myself incredibly curious about what they were really like because we really only see them through Doyle's eyes um and uh you know they I was just very curious about how they came to be and things like that yeah there's not a there's not a lot of information about uh, you know the the background of, of the people that harvested this mushroom before the the book starts and we only get very vague bits here and there but I did construct a a narrative for myself of what I think happened. Uh, so other people might have alternate theories, again, because it's vague, more than one theory could be true. But my own uh, building of the story was that uh, Howard was kind of like a John D sort of figure. And John D was an, um, an astrologer and scientist in the time of the reign of Elizabeth I. And uh, he did, uh, he, but he was also involved in occultism and things like that. So he was a very interesting figure. And so I thought if he was somebody like that who straddled both this the kind of occult sort of stuff and the scientific in that early time period. And that he had come in touch actually with Scottish people because the name Doyle is not English. I took it from Arthur Conan Doyle and he's not English. Um, and so, so I thought, you know, okay, so maybe he comes in touch with these uh, Scottish people who are raising this fungus and then he uh, kind of grabs it and um, has his power base somewhere, you know, maybe in the north of England or, or Scotland. And then the locals start getting uh, upset and angsty through the decades, just like in Dracula, that the locals start knowing like there's a damn vampire on the hill. Or there's something weird going on. And, and in Dracula, Dracula moves. He, he hires Jonathan Harker precisely that, so that he can buy him a house in England and he can move all his coffins and all his stuff to a new location in part because he has bled dry the, the old location and people are on to him. And so that's what Dracula is doing. And I thought that's what Howard's doing. He's also, he's bled the region where he was dry, um, where, where he used to have his power base somewhere in the UK. And, uh, and so now he's heading to Mexico 
and establishing a new power base there and uh, making remaking his world. So it's it's a Dracula esque journey that is happening in in the story. But again, because there's not enough detail, people can make up uh, other backgrounds and stories of exactly what happened before and where where did the fungus originate geographically and who was he in touch with. We don't get too much detail there, but that was a, the story that I constructed myself. And uh, yeah, because of uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, a uh, famous yeah. mystery author of Sherlock Holmes and uh, uh, extremely racist man <laughs> too, yes. at the same time. Uh, so just like H.P. Lovecraft. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, when I, I I appreciate you saying that because when I started reading uh, Mexican Gothic, I, I had managed to avoid spoilers and I totally thought it was going to turn out to be a vampire story because, you know, yeah. you've got the dirt being brought from England and it, it kind of is. I mean, it's not exactly a red herring, but I, I get the feeling that you were, in fact, purposefully playing with readers' expectations there. Uh. Yeah, I mean, it was always a fungus. It was it was always sure. a mushroom. There was never a vampire involved. But uh, this this kind of is kind of playing with some of the um, popular elements of the gothic fiction, and and the goat the ghost is not quite a ghost, and and the vampire is not quite a vampire. But symbolically, you can sort of see how Howard is a vampire, not a literal vampire, but maybe a metaphorical vampire because he. Uh, feeds off the locals he drains their you know they all die drains their life in a way their wealth uh, their their way of living and he is he has a sort of parasitical relationship with the people in in the land and so he's definitely a bringer of destruction and disease and harm just like the vampire figure often brings those elements into the narrative uh tying pestilence with uh with this guy who's coming here um so he's a sort of metaphorical vampire, but not a literal vampire with fangs or, or, or a Dracula. Uh, he's a dracula figure without being quite a Dracula. And, and that's playing again with, with some of the elements of the Gothic. Definitely. Um, some of the, the names that you chose for your characters are references to other authors like Howard Doyle um, being named after H.P. Lovecraft and Arthur Conan Doyle. And for me, Virgil, I thought, okay, it kind of evokes Dante's Inferno and the underworld. Um, are there other names that you use that have kind of symbolism behind them or references? Uh, yeah, almost everybody in the cast is, is referencing a figure of either film or literature tied to horror fiction. So yeah, Howard is Howard is after Lovecraft and, and Doyle after, after Conan Doyle. Um, we've got Francis, who is named after Freddie Francis. He was a horror film director. He made films like The Screaming Skull. Uh, Noemi Tabuada is named after Tabuada, who was uh, Carlos Enrique Tabuada, a Mexican horror film director of gothic films. He shot films such as um, Poison for the Fairies and Darker Than the Night would be the English language titles. So he's quite of a cult uh, Mexican horror director. And Virgil is actually named after Virgil Finley, an artist of the early uh, Weird Tales era. He made uh, fantastic science fiction, fantasy, and horror illustrations. And they're very beautiful if you look at them online. Um, and Florence, Florence is named after Florence Marriott. And she was a writer that wrote in the 1800s a vampire novel around the time that Stoker is writing Dracula. So those are um, kind of the people that populate the novel. They're all named after, after some figures of that time period. Very cool, thank you. Um, the Doyle family, um, but especially Howard, have this obsession with eugenics and bloodlines. Um, would you be willing to say more about the historical context for the, that outlook and how you came to incorporate it into your novel? I, uh, my thesis actually was in eugenics, Lovecraft and women. That's where my thesis work lies. So I know about a lot about that. Um, eugenics was a science. Um, it's now not considered a science anymore, but at the time period when it emerged, it was considered a serious scientific okay. discourse. Oh, oh, I'm hearing somebody. Yep, we've got somebody who's not muted. Hang on. Oh, I don't think I can do that. Oh, yeah, there we go. It's been muted. Thank uh, you. Yeah, 
no worries. Sourdough buns are good. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Eugenics is not good. Um, Yeah. So eugenics is this thought process that uh, that started in the 1800s where people started thinking, well, you know, we make better cows by breeding them. If I want a cow that gives no more milk, I can breed this cow with this bull and create a super cow. Why can't we create super people? If we breed the right people, we will create a better human race, which all sounds very scientific and kind of a good idea until you start to wonder, well, who decides who is a superior and an inferior human being and what does that constitute? So very quickly, we get this sort of pyramid where again, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant people, wealthy ones are at the top of the pyramid and then at the bottom of the pyramid are others. And so those include, you know, people like me, Mexican people and, you know, black people, Asian people. And so in this pyramid, then those are the undesirables, the people that we don't want to be mixing with. Um, And then people start thinking, well, okay, but what about a ability and disability. We don't want a blind person or a mute person because they're inferior people. They're not superior people. So let's, let's not get, let's not, let's get rid of those. And these um, take the shape of things sometimes like uh, um, dragging women into clinics and sterilizing them so they cannot have babies who are inferior, committing people to uh, mental institutions so that they are put out of the way. And it culminates obviously in the 1940s and when uh, Hitler is in power with the extermination of Jewish people and other undesirable groups. Uh, So after that, we see kind of eugenics lose popularity because it's been associated with with Nazis and all that kind of stuff. So people don't like it anymore uh, quite by that name. But before that, it's, it's just hugely popular and you see it everywhere in textbooks and in popular culture where everybody is kind of concerned with better breeding and even things like immigration acts restricting the number of Chinese people or eliminating the number of Chinese people who are coming into places like the United States or Canada are taking place because of eugenic processes and thoughts that you know these are not desirable people that this is not how we make a good breeding stock with these people and uh, and so Howard Doyle is um, sort of fascinated by that. And it's 1950, and it's a little bit late in the day, but he's also very old fashioned about a lot of old things. It's kind of like the colonial spirit trying to survive in the modern eras. He's holding on to a lot of old things and old thought processes because he doesn't want to let go, obviously, of the colonial power that he embodies. Yes. Well, uh, we've got a little bit less than 10 minutes left. Are there any other questions from the audience? Okay. Um, ah, thank you for sharing. Would we would we happen to be able to have a hint on any future product projects? Sorry, I'm stumbling there. Yes, um, I have a reissue of a novel that was published yeah. a couple of years ago yeah. called Untamed Shore, and that will be happening in the UK in February and then in the US, I'm not sure when, but sometime next year. So that's a reissue. And Untamed Short takes place in 1979 in Baja California. It's a young adult novel, well, not a young adult novel, but a coming of age novel about a young woman. And it's also a noir. And the other thing, my new book that's coming out in July of 2023 is called Silver Nitrate that is set in 1993 in Mexico City. It's about a couple of friends. One of them is a sound editor. The other one is a former soap opera actor who come in contact with a old movie that might be haunted. And so that one is more of a supernatural thriller kind of story. And that will be out in July. Very cool. What, um, what are you reading right now that you're really enjoying? I'm doing research right now, so I'm not reading any <laughs> any, any fiction. Oh, uh, sad trombone. <laughs> yes, sad trombone. Houston, Houston, this is Mary Kay. Yes. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Fantastic. Okay. Go ahead, Karen. Um, was the character of Catalina, when I first started mm-hmm. reading it, I was reminded of the governess in turn of the screw. Oh, okay. Not yeah. Thinking at all. 
Uh, I wasn't specifically thinking about Turn of the Screw, but I can see, uh, you know, some of the elements of the Gothic novel that she embodies. I was, uh, my direct inspiration for her was a short story by a writer called Horacio Quiroga, which is called The Feather Pillow. And it, just the beginning to the beginning paragraph of that story was what inspired me uh, for Catalina. It's about a young woman who has been recently married and she's not feeling too well. And, uh, and just that opening paragraph I thought was very Catalina-esque. Um, there are some elements of the yellow wallpaper, of course, in the way that uh, Catalina is kind of being kept locked up in that sense. And I do like Henry James quite a bit, but I was not thinking uh, consciously at least about the governess in that story. Do we have another question from the audience? Yeah. Kirsten, hold on one moment. I got. Come on. Oh, do I have to say it? Yep. Just ask it. Um, yes. Hello. I was wondering, given the. I was wondering about the Francis character, since usually in traditional Gothic romance, there's a young, ingenue, virginal woman. I'm thinking Francis kind of reminds me of that on the other side. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think Francis is definitely the virginal ingenue. Um, yeah, there's a, Francis is supposed to be um, the anti-Virgil and, and Virgil is obviously the Byronic man. So it's the anti-Byronic man, the complete opposite of the traditional Gothic hero that's supposed to make you soon. Um, so he's he's not a Heathcliff, he's kind of, quite of the opposite and he, is definitely an intellectual and um, his disposition for plants and botanical uh, types would normally position him as, as a female figure rather than a, than a guy. But yeah, he's, uh, he is the fainting, the fainting swooning damsel in, in many senses. And he's trapped in a castle, like a princess in a castle, right? So Noemi is really his, his knight in shining armor. Interesting. I like that. <laughs> um, I've got a question from Bridget Kim who asks who is your favorite Mexican author and which books would you recommend oh um, I mean if, if we're talking horror fiction there's a collection called The House Guest and Other Stories and it's by a very um, it's she wrote, she passed away now, Amparo Davila. She wrote stories that were kind of in the Shirley Jackson mode. So not uh, kind of psychological horror as opposed to killer clowns or, or giant crabs or something like that. So I quite like her. She's sort of a, uh, one of the uh, few writers of horror fiction in Mexican literature. And uh, so she's quite fun. The House Guest and other stories. And then the guy I mentioned, he's not Mexican, but Horacio Quiroga wrote is considered kind of like a Poe and an Edgar Allan Poe sort of guy. And he has a collection that's called uh, The Decapitated Chicken and Other Stories. And that's where you can find the feather pillow. And you can find it for free online actually, because he's he's quite old. So not not the house guest, but the, the feather pillow you can find online for free if you want to read it. And it's quite short, it's like a Poe po sort of story, just like you read the Gaia or the Raven, you can read it pretty quickly. So those two. I would say are good. Uh, and then contemporaries, I published a list. If you look Ofra and Silvia Moreno Garcia and something like Hispanic Heritage Month, I published a recommended list of Hispanic authors that have published in the last five years stuff that I recommend. And, or if you go through my Twitter feed, but if you search for it, you will probably find it. And so if you want more contemporary stuff, uh, there's uh, like um, Agustina Basterica, and Mariana Enriquez and some other writers. And you can read that through and see if there's anything there that interests you that is speculative and, and also Hispanic. And of course, if we don't have them at the library, let us know. We, we love yes. patron requests. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe we have time for one more question. Um, is there anyone in the live audience who had a question? Laura? Where did you write your book? Uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia, partially on the bus as I was commuting, and uh, and then at home late at nights in the attic. So that's uh, <laughs> so. perfect. That's somehow apropos. Yeah. 
So we don't have a lot of space in Vancouver. I live in a small townhouse, so yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here. This was really wonderful. I really enjoyed having a chance to talk with you today. And uh, thank you so much for, for sharing all your, your thoughts and spending some time with us this afternoon. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, have a great afternoon. <laughs>